Okay, a couple things to talk about today. First of all, someone asked if I would do an update on the breast explant surgery that I had back at the beginning of September. So it's been just over four months since I got it done. And let's see where to start. The post op, like the, the week after surgery was rough for me because you have to, they put drains in when you get your, um, explants or your implants removed. And my, one of my drains got infected and it was extremely painful and we didn't know it was infected until a few days after. And I just kept being like, this seems like it's really painful. Like, are you sure this strain is supposed to be this uncomfortable? And I, the doctor on the phone or the nurse would be like, yeah, it's typical. They're not comfortable. And I'm like, not comfortable or like excruciatingly painful. <laughs> so um, once we figured out that I had an infection, I got an antibiotic and it was fine. And then pulling the tubes out was disgusting, but I got through it. I'm not, I'm very like, I don't know how my husband's a doctor and I like can't deal with blood or surgery or anything like that. Um, so the healing happened pretty quick after like a few weeks, I felt like I had pretty good range of motion, obviously like strength wise, I wasn't doing any kind of exercise at all. Like with my upper body, um, it just felt like tight, kind of sore still. Um, the end result, <laughs> this is something I want to be really transparent with. And they told me this and I, I was kind of like, yeah, I know, I know, I know. But for reals, they are like non-existent. And I knew that because before I got my implants in, which is why I got them in all those years ago, was because I was always really insecure with how small my chest was. Like I never really developed in that regard. And so when they came out, I don't know why I thought, well, maybe since I'm a grown woman now, they won't be as flat, but they certainly and most definitely are. Um, and at first it was sort of an adjustment, but I also loved like how light I felt up here. Like I could cross my arms, I could scratch my back. I could like do things that I couldn't do before where, or lay on my side and they were kind of in the way. Um, actually one funny thing is when I would lay on my side, once they were gone, I guess I, they were, they, 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 I can't talk. They acted kind of like a buoy. So like when I lay on my side, they'd almost like keep me propped on my side. And so after I got them removed, I laid on my side in the first little bit because I was so used to kind of them holding me up. I would like roll over onto my stomach. Like, and there was nothing to like hold me up. And it was just, just little things like that that you wouldn't think about or wouldn't have anticipated being an issue were. Um, now I can lay on my side and I've adjusted, my body has adjusted to staying on my side and not rolling onto my stomach. Um, I wore a sports bra for the first probably like month after, um, I got it done and that was just for comfort and also because I wanted to keep it like kind of tightly wrapped. Then I went to, <laughs> I finally decided, I think I need to buy a bra. Like with my sports bra and I was like indented, like absolutely nothing. And so I was like, I think I need to buy a bra. So I went to Victoria's Secret with my husband and we're like shopping around for like double A's and there's like not a big selection of double A's in Victoria's Secret. And this lady finally comes up and she's like, hey, do you guys need help? Do you want to be sized? And so she sizes me and she's like, you're a, uh, I don't know what she said, like a 34B. And my husband's like, a B? Like out loud. <laughs> I couldn't believe like he's seen how flat I am. She's like, yeah, he's a B. She's a B. He's like, oh yeah, no. Yeah, for sure. Like I think he totally did not believe there's any way it could be. And I don't, it could be a B. And I don't think that even this lady measured right. But I was like, yeah, Zach, I'm a B. Yeah, let's find me some Bs. So I found the most padded bras that I could find. And even those, like, they don't fit great. And I am very, very flat still. But I do love, I still notice, like, when I'm in the shower, I notice the difference in the change. And I love it. Like, I actually love, and I talked about this right after surgery, just, like, how it's just me now. I don't have any kind of, like, fake stuff in me that's making me look or appear in a way that's not actually me. And so even though I'm really flat and even though all of my tops fit me very differently and some of them I had to get rid of because they're just like gaping on top um, or just like way too low now because there's nothing there to fill them out. Um, I'm really happy I did it. I still am really happy. I don't miss them at all. I'll see pictures like that pop up from, you know, you have memories will pop up and I'm like, wow, that shirt certainly fits different now. But it's, yeah, I'm glad I did it. I really am. So that was my update on that. If you're someone who, this person who wrote was like, I've had them in for 20 plus years and I worry a little bit about health, you know, consequences of having them in that long with having a foreign object, which is something I was worried about as well. Um, and she's like, I just don't know how I'm going to feel about having them out. And I don't know, I guess it's hard to say, like if I was in a place where I was extremely insecure in my body, which is where I was when I got them in and I got them out, it probably would mess with me a little bit, but I felt like I was in a really good place, um, as far as like body image goes and really just kind of accepting 
my natural self that I felt like I was able to handle it okay. So that's my advice to you. If you're in a place where you're like, I kind of just want to, along with just accepting my express body weight, I just want to be me and not have these fake things in me anymore. Do it. It's very liberating. Very, very liberating. But if you're still at a place where you're like hanging on for your life and recovery and you've had a lot of weight gain and you're just holding on to those fake boobs and just keep the fake boobs. If it helps you to get through recovery and it helps you to gain the weight, then just keep them. So that's my advice. Um, let's see. What was I going to talk about today? I was going to talk about how much I love my job. And for this reason, because I get to talk to people who are so, so, so scared to eat unrestrictedly. They want you so badly. They want to give themselves that permission so badly, but they've been told by dietitians, parents, loved ones, um, significant others, um, you name it. People have told them that just to let your body be and just to eat whatever you want is gluttonous, irresponsible, unhealthy. All these things have just been like, drilled into their head in addition to just like diet culture. And so when I get someone and I, I especially like in a first session, we're talking about like what unrestricted eating means, what it needs to look like, what they're doing now and how it needs to change in order to get themselves to eat unrestrictedly. And they kind of start getting a clearer picture of what that looks like. It's like sometimes people get emotional and they'll start, they'll start crying just out of joy, just like such relief, like somebody is letting me or encouraging me or telling me this is okay. And the reason that they're crying is because that's exactly what they want to do. Like that's exactly what they want to do, but they're terrified to do it. And so to have someone on the other side saying, Hey, I've been there before. I know what this feels like. And yes, these are things you actually indeed need to do. And yes, you actually need to quadruple and significantly increase what you're eating. Even though you think you're eating a lot, you're still far off. And I know that because your mental hunger the way that you're talking to me, I don't care what your weight is and that'll always come up, but I'm not at my lowest, but I'm at a heavier weight now. But I'm, and I, I just like, I, again, I'm just talking to your mental hunger right now. And based off of the five minutes we've talked, you have extreme hunger and you need to be eating way more food. And then that's when the, mo the emotions come probably partly because they're terrified, but also just that sense of relief. And I love that I can do that as a coach with confidence. Like I can actually say that with confidence. I'm not saying that like, I hope that was the right thing to say to them or, Ooh, I hope that doesn't destroy their health. Like I can actually say that with confidence that that is the best advice someone can give you in the state that you're in when you're in recovery and your mind is spinning with food, spinning with food and just completely inundated with stupid food rules and crazy high amounts of fear of weight gain. All of those things lead me to believe that you are really hungry and that you need to teach your brain that food is abundant. And you do that by eating way more food than you ever imagined possible way more food than you ever thought you'd permit yourself to be able to eat. And you'll surprise yourself as you do that. And as you're really, really bold, you'll start to feel your brain change. And if you're in recovery and you're like, I don't know what you're talking about when you say that, Becky, well, you're not being bold enough then. I'm talking like as, as aggressive and brave and courageous as you possibly can be. And so if you're eating, I don't know, 10 huge pancakes for breakfast, and you're just like, Becky, like I used to eat half a pancake and now I'm eating so many. Like this is for sure unrestricted eating, but I'm still thinking about food when I finish it. And I still am, you know, like obsessing over calories and I'm still worried so much about weight gain. It's then it's not enough food, right? And so when you go to eat, I want you to ask yourself, if I had no knowledge whatsoever, no knowledge of what food was good, what food was bad, all these things I've been told, I had no knowledge of that. I had no knowledge of what was an appropriate amount of food to eat or what normal eaters eat. I have not, knew nothing about anything. I just sat down and I thought right now in this moment, what do I want to eat? Completely regardless to what I ate before, regardless to what I'm going to eat in the future. In this moment, I'm just going to focus on what's true and I'm going to drop all judgment about it and I'm just going to follow through with it. And then after you eat that, after you eat that huge, tremendous, large amount of food, you're going to completely forget about it. You're going to just pretend like it's not there anymore gone Whew, out of your memory. It's like a clean slate. The next time you eat, you pick up as if like it was a completely new day and you're going to eat whatever you want to eat. So if you just had three boxes of cereal an hour ago, you go in the kitchen and you're feeling kind of munchy and you're like, gosh, cereal sounds so good. And you're like, never, I would never have cereal again. I just ate all that cereal. What's wrong with me? I have obsessed with cereal. Who cares? It doesn't matter. It's as if it never happened. And now you get to sit down and have three more boxes of cereal. Okay. And then another thing I wanted to touch on in this video is kind of hopping from place to place, but this is just, I just had a session and these are some things I wanted to talk about in a video. The other thing is when you have buzzwords, I call them buzzwords in recovery, um, that constantly come up, they're reoccurring in your mind all day long and they're eating disorder fueled. So things like, um, I should wait, I should save, 
Um, I don't deserve to eat. I'm going to gain so much weight, right? So deserve, weight, save, weight gain, weight as in W-A-I-T, like I'm going to wait to eat or procrastinate eating or delay eating. I'm going to save up my calories. I'm going to save up the treats for later. Um, I don't deserve to eat. I haven't done enough. I'm not a good person. Um, I lied to so-and-so. I didn't show up for that friend. I um, don't do anything cool in my life. I don't deserve to eat. And then the, um, I'm afraid of weight gain. This, what's this going to do to my body? What's gonna, those are four major buzzwords. There's a long list. I'm sure that you can come up with more than that. But those are going to be some major buzzwords that when you hear them, you shove food in your mouth. Every time those words come up into your brain, sh shove food in your mouth. And that is a very effective tool. I did that myself in recovery. Whenever I'd have those thoughts, I'm like, oh, this thought, this word gets me every time. I don't deserve to. I haven't moved enough today. I don't deserve to. I was rude to my husband this morning. I don't deserve to. 20 years ago when I did that stupid thing, I don't deserve. And it was always the stupid deserve thing. And it got me and it kept me from eating. It was very effective at getting me to restrict. And so then when I was in recovery and I caught on to that, it's like, I don't deserve. Yes, I do. In fact, I'm going to eat a brownie right now. In fact, I'm going to have a donut right now. In fact, I'm having a big glass of chocolate milk right now because I do deserve to eat. And that's how you have to kind of squash those thoughts immediately. And that's how you stop a lot of eating disorder generated thoughts from coming in and you allowing them just to kind of subconsciously cause you to restrict. So make a list, write out those words. They're very visible in your kitchen or in your phone or in your car, wherever you're going to be throughout the day. And then when you have those words, immediately act on them by eating food that scares you. So that's my message to you today. Have a good day.